I had been living back home for a couple of months after getting out of jail. Sunday was the one day my parents had off and my dad loved to sleep in. Uh, of course, my mom was up cooking breakfast and the smell dragged my dad out from under the covers. He turned on the news and settled in with a cup of coffee. The cup never reached his lips. Mike, get up. You need to come see this. There's something on the news, my mom softly said through the door to my room. Ooh, oh, I articulately replied. Mike, really, get up. It's on the news. There was a concern in her voice that crept into my dreams and stirred me. What? What's going on? Uh, Mike, it's Afghanistan. A helicopter went down in Afghanistan. My sister was deployed in Afghanistan with the 41st Rescue Squadron. She was a co-pilot on one of the three Pave Hawks at Kandahar Air Force Base. The newscaster said again, we cannot confirm the names of the crew, but we can confirm at this time that all six crew members are dead. The TV was on CNN headline news, which meant we heard the same story again every 30 minutes. This was the third time it had gone around, and we were all still afraid to say anything. A, a pave hawk went down in Afghanistan. We knew the pave hawk went down in Afghanistan, and it came from Kandahar Air Force Base. But wait, did he just say the... 41st Rescue Squadron? My mom was pulling up all the email that we'd gotten from Tammy since she'd been deployed. She uh, yelled out of the computer room, there are three crews. My dad still hadn't taken a drink of his coffee. I hadn't moved since I came out of my room. Did you hear me? She said there are three crews, was repeated from the computer room. We both knew what this meant. There was a 33.3% .3 chance that my sister was dead. This couldn't be happening. Out of all the hundreds of thousands of people stationed all over the world, there's no way that it was her. Afghanistan, Kandahar, 31st Rescue Squadron, Pavehawk, Three Crews. Everything kept floating around my mind looking for a place to settle down and start making sense. My mom shouted out again. The last email we got from her was yesterday. She said she just got done flying a missing. Uh, she's, she's off duty and, and she's on her way home in the morning, she says. My dad and I took a huge breath. My dad said, she'll call. She knows we'll see the news, and she'll call soon, so we'll know she's all right. This is the first thing I heard my dad say all morning. Stay online and keep checking the email. She might send us something if she can't get to the phone. That was the second thing my dad said all morning. It was settled. Dad said it. It was so. She would call. We knew she was fine. She was off duty as of this morning. It had to be one of the other crews. God, it's still terrible, I thought. What a, what a close call, I lamented. I was sure she knew all those people, at least, and I was thinking about how horrible it was over there for her right now. And for their families. God, that must suck for their families. They're getting the news just like us, but, but they don't know which crew it was that went down. I felt terrible for them. And really thankful for the email from my sister. My mom finished breakfast, and we sat down and pretended to eat. We couldn't stop staring at the TV long enough to actually get any food into our mouths. There it was every 30 minutes on the nose. A Pavlov helicopter crashed this morning in Afghanistan. Those poor families. Tammy must be freaked out too. At least she had Casey. Her fiance Casey was stationed at the same base with her. I thanked God for that. He flew C-130s, so I knew he was fine. The TV didn't say anything about a C-130. I thanked God that she'd be home soon, and she had that comfort. And Casey was coming home a month later, just in time for their wedding. I, I couldn't wait. She'd been going nuts planning the whole thing. I remembered how much work uh, planning my wedding was, and then I thought about how badly it had to suck to plan one from a war zone. She'd, she'd have a month to make all the final arrangements once she got home, and then he'd be back, and they'd be married, and life would go on. We'd be happy. Thinking about watching Tammy and Casey get married almost pulled me out of my stupid depression from the divorce. Even though I'd been out of jail for a couple of months, I still couldn't seem to shake the funk from the whole situation. I was, I was so pissed that I didn't get to spend any time with my sister the year before she went on deployment. The only reason our military was in that godforsaken country was because those fucking sand niggers flew those goddamn planes into our buildings on that day in September over a year earlier. Thinking of where my sister was reminded me of why she was there, which reminded me of what else happened on that day, which reminded me of why I missed all of that time with her before she left. 
and it wasn't a pleasant cycle. But I was really looking forward to making up for lost time over the summer. The, the summer was going to be great. It would be just what I needed to get back on track. At some point in the afternoon, Dad turned the TV off. There's nothing new about the crash, no point dwelling on it. She'll call soon. I'm sure things are crazy over there right now. My mom and I agreed silently and felt better that he had a hold of the situation. That's exactly how it would be. No news is good news, he said every four hours or so. As we looked at the phone that wasn't ringing, we knew that the Air Force would notify the families as soon as possible, and it comforted us that we hadn't heard anything. Dad was sure there was a perfectly good explanation for why she hadn't been able to get to the phone and let us know that she was okay. Uh, maybe they couldn't talk to anyone until the families were notified. That didn't make a lot of sense, but it was enough. It was a reason, and that was all we needed to know that she was okay and go on with our day. I called Dean and told him about the crash, and he said it'd be fine. There's no way it was her. Odds were against it. I told him that's what I said. Freaking crazy, though, we agreed and nervously laughed it off. She's fine, Mike, he told me one more time before we hung up. I wondered for a second why he felt the need to repeat that, and it ended up being more unsettling than if he hadn't said anything at all. It had been too long. She should have called or emailed. We should have heard something. The Oscars were starting at this point in the evening, and we definitely should have heard from her. She was on her way back home, surely. Uh, we talked about the chance of her having to stay in Afghanistan longer because of the accident, and my mom worried about the wedding plans and hoped that she'd get back in time. It'll all work out, said Dad. She'll be home in no time. Let's stop fretting about it and just watch the show. We'll hear from her soon, he said, and it made us feel marginally better. The Oscars were late that year due to some strike or something, but it, it didn't matter. I, I normally loved watching them and secretly made my picks for all of the categories, but that year I hadn't seen any movies because of the horrible marriage in jail, so it wasn't providing the distraction that I needed. I felt terrible. It didn't make any sense to me at all. There was no reason why I should have felt that way. Tammy was fine. Everything was fine. I, I, I thought that maybe I should pray. I... I hadn't done it in a really long time, but it might make that feeling go away. It certainly couldn't hurt. God, please don't let that be Tammy's chopper. Wait, wait, I knew a chopper went down, and I knew that all six crew members died. There was no way that any higher power was going to make that not happen now. So what was I praying for? I was praying that someone else died? How could that be morally right? Could I... Could I pray, please, 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 let that be someone else's brother or sister or son or daughter? Wouldn't they be praying the same prayer right then, wishing that it was Tammy's crew? It didn't, it didn't feel right. It didn't matter anyway. God had nothing to do with this. What was done was done. It happened for a reason, and Tammy was fine. I tried to care about who won the best screenplay. No one said anything for a long time. It was at least halfway through the show, and the tension in the room was palpable. I knew that we were all thinking about it, but no one wanted to say what we were thinking about, and... We were all pretending that none of us were thinking about anything. Best documentary was up. Michael Moore had just won for Bowling for Columbine. He started his speech and then went off on a tirade about how it's funny to get an award for a documentary when real life is so fictitious at the moment. He said we're fighting a fictitious war with a fictitious president before the music rose and he unwillingly relinquished the stage. I heard more boos than applause, which was good, that fat. Fuck, I thought. Fictitious wore my ass. Six people just died and their families had to get that news today. Tell them it's fictitious, you fucking prick. Lefty liberal asshole. My anger felt good, and it was the first time all day I hadn't been frozen with fear on the inside. Ha, huh, fuck him. All right. I fucking hated Michael Moore. That felt right. That felt better. I finally got my mind off of it. Everything was fine. I looked up my, my dad, and I was just about to crack a joke when we, we heard a knock on our door. No one ever knocks on our door. We lived on three acres out in the middle of nowhere. Of course, all three of us jumped. We, we looked at each other and saw the same panic-stricken face. It was kind of like we were staring into a mirror. My dad rushed to the door. My mom and I stayed behind, just slightly looking over his shoulder as he opened it. There were three men, all in uniforms. Is this the long residence? Oh no, 
Oh God, no, is all my dad could get out. Sir, are you the family of Captain Tammy Long? My mom asked what's wrong, what's happening, why are they here, even though we all knew the answers to those questions. Ma'am, may we please come in? No, 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 tell us what's wrong, what happened? Sir, ma'am, we regret to inform you that this morning while flying over Ghazni, Afghanistan, your daughter's helicopter crashed. There were no survivors. We are terribly sorry for your loss and eternally grateful for your sacrifice. No, my mom yelled. No, no. My dad stood back from the door and looked at her with such a loss in his face. She yelled the most painful, gut-wrenching noise I'd ever heard. My dad tried to hold her, but she just pushed him away. She ran past me and didn't even move. She was pacing around the room. She ran past me and I didn't even move. She was pacing around the room looking for something that wasn't there, desperately, frantically searching with her eyes. Finally, she stopped and stood in the middle of the living room and sobbed. Her body curled in upon itself as if she was about to slowly implode as the sobs rocked her head and shook the tears from her eyes. My dad went to her and put his arm around her. His, his face was stricken. He had been saying, no, oh God, no, Tammy, oh God, Tammy over and over, but now was silent as the tears came. I stood there looking at my parents as if I was completely disembodied. It wasn't an out-of-body experience as much as it was simply the feeling of not existing, of observing reality without being in it. The two officers and chaplains slowly stepped through the doorway and into the foyer. I hadn't realized in, until this moment, but tears were streaming down my face down my nose and into my mouth, dripping off my chin. I was sobbing like a child. I was holding my breath for fear of making any noise, and, and now I, I gulped in air as if I was drowning. I tried to stop. I tried to take a normal breath, but I couldn't keep from squealing and snorting and coughing. I was sucking in air through a blanket of snot and tears that now covered my face. I, I moved for the first time in what felt like years and went to my parents where they were kneeling on the living room floor and I wanted to hug them but I, I didn't know how. My dad stood up and looked at me with eyes that were burning with pain, searing into me with anger, yet at the same time trying to comfort me as, as if he wanted to soothe me but he knew he couldn't. We held each other for a moment and I felt myself break. Being in my father's arms, I felt like I was three again and someone had stolen something from me. I wanted to throw a tantrum. I wanted him to make it all better. I, I didn't know what I was missing, but it hurt so fucking badly. I'd initially put my arms around him because I wanted to comfort him, but now he was literally holding me upright. I, I stepped back slightly and put my left arm around my mom, and we held each other like that, the three of us, just supporting each other's weight, sobbing together in some sort of morbid rhythm. Finally, we were able to break from the embrace and we walked to the kitchen table where the officers were standing, hats in hand, almost as if they were at attention, standing guard over our grieving. The chaplain asked us to sit, tried to comfort my parents, and held their hands as he prayed. I didn't want to pray. The moment he mentioned the name of God, I was filled with an anger that I'd never known before. My pain was drowned out by a burning rage and it felt better. It, it felt right. If there was anyone to blame for this, it'd be him, right? If there's, if there's anyone who could have stopped it, it'd be him, right? Well, then fuck him. If this was his plan or his will, then fuck him. Why would I want to pray to someone who would choose this as his will? Why, why, why do I want to give thanks or ask for any comfort? The moment I knew that that was the person, if he existed, who caused this pain, I knew that if there was a God, he and I were no longer on good terms. I felt more confident in my hatred than I'd ever felt in my faith. After what felt like an eternity, the officers and chaplain left. They'd done their best to comfort us, and really I felt bad for them. That had to be the shittiest job in the world, and I was grateful that they did it. Towards the end, it was weird anyway. My, my mom had composed herself to some extent, but then she was almost trying to play hostess to them as if they were invited guests, and we were putting them out with all of our grief. She showed them pictures of Tammy and told them stories about her. Hearing her brag about Tammy to those strangers was heartbreaking. It, it was so obvious that she was so proud of her daughter. I almost completely lost it all over again. 
my dad was solemn and quiet as he took down all the information they had about the remains and the funeral arrangements. Casey had been given leave and was accompanying the body back to the States. My sister. They were talking about my sister. She was the remains and the body. I couldn't handle it. I walked outside to get a breath of air and completely broke down on the porch. I couldn't remember the last time I saw her. The last time we spoke, it was on the phone over a horrible connection. I remember telling her to be careful over there. The last thing I said to her was, if you get yourself killed, I'm going to kick your fucking ass. And I could hear the smile in her voice when she responded, you can try, Mike. You can, you can try. She couldn't be gone.